I'm delighted to be here, and I was particularly delighted to be in Morecambe yesterday evening. And there's one lesson that I bring from that. It's not just for Morecambe, it's for everywhere. These are people who've started community campaigning from scratch, and they're transforming Morecambe, and they're transforming politics there as well. That's something to build on. And if they can do it there, other people can do it elsewhere. Uh, it's a great honor uh, and a great pleasure to deliver the Vic Bingham Memorial Lecture. I knew Vic, Vic and I was very fond of him, and he was a very fine liberal and a great loss. Uh, it's appropriate too that it's here in Lancaster. I was born and brought up as a Lancashire exile, uh, to a long family tradition of radical nonconformist liberalism. But that pleasure is tinged, tinged by sadness, sadness at the passing of Tony Greaves. It's a tragedy that he can't be with us, but I'm delighted to learn of the Tony Greaves Award, the first of which will be made later today. That's a fitting way of remembering. Um, nobody would have been more appropriate to lecture us today. And lecture us he would have been, because that was his style. Um, he always said it as it was, but he wasn't really confrontational or objectionable, as sometimes he's presented. He was actually a very gentle and kind man and a great friend to many of us. Tony was one of the outstanding liberals and liberal, sorry, Tony was one of the outstanding liberals of his generation, contributing more to the liberal and democrat parties than most of its leaders. And I'm, I'm putting my more modest contribution into the shade. I owe him a great debt of gratitude it is he, after all, who commissioned Gordon Lishman and myself to write the theory and practice of community politics. His contribution was immense. It is important to be clear what community politics is not. It is not a technique for winning local government elections. It is an ideology, a system of ideas for the transformation of society. It needs a strategy of political action for those ideas to become a reality. To be successful, that strategy requires effective campaigning techniques. Those techniques are not an end in themselves, but a means to an end. And community politics is not local, it's universal, applicable to all communities, whether geographical or communities of interest, from family to the world. Community politics is not about winning elections, but elections are an essential ingredient in the process of community politics, a necessary means of delivering its objectives. If they and the holding of political office become ends in themselves, we will have been corrupted, as so many have been, by the very system of government and administration that community politics sets out to challenge. Nor is community politics solely about government. It is about people exercising power over their lives and their environment, about the distribution and dissemination of power throughout society, about its use and its control. It's not limited to the making of decisions within the structures of government. Community politics involves a dual approach acting within those structures and outside them directly within society to achieve social transformation. Community politics is not something other political parties or political philosophies can embrace. They may copy its techniques or its trappings, but community politics is essentially a liberal, a system of ideas for the creation of a liberal society. A liberal society is based on liberal values. They are universal, they are not relative or culturally specific. They are values to be aspired to 
strived and campaigned for, and where possible implemented in all societies, countries and communities. The measure to which a society is liberal is through the experience of individuals, collective experience, whether it be loyalty to the nation and nationalism, or the solidarity of the working classes, uh, and, um, or any other manifestation of group identity and loyalty, exists only so far as it is experienced by the individuals who comprise those groups. Liberalism values each individual equally. It aims to enable and encourage all individuals to fulfill their own potential in the way they choose. People have an immense capacity for self-direction, self-cultivation, self-understanding, and creativity. We are all different. We have different loyalties, different ideas of self, different abilities, different aims and objectives, and make different choices. Liberalism values and promotes the diversity individual freedom brings to society. But individuals cannot survive on their own. We're all born into, live and die within groups, many of which are stable enough to be called communities. They are essential for our existence, our survival, and our well being. We all belong to many communities. They vary in nature, size, and in their significance to individuals. They include communities of re residence, neighborhoods, geographical location and nationality, of faith, religion, or lack of it, of culture, language, and history, of work, trade, or profession, of friendship, recreation, intellectual pursuits, the arts and sport, of exclusion, oppression, discrimination, vulnerability, and victimization, and of course, of campaigning, social activism, and politics. The most immediate community is the family, often the most strongly felt. The nature and quality of its structures for relationships profoundly influencing feelings of happiness, security, well-being, and personal significance. Some communities are latent, emergingly, emerging only in the face of threat. Some are informal and unstructured. Some have loose frameworks, some are highly organized, and some are constituted political authorities with defined powers existing within a legal framework. Increasingly, some communities are wholly or in part virtual with an online existence, as we have today. Communities bring great benefits to their members, but also risks and dangers. The benefits are not just emotional, a sense of support in community, but also practical. Functional communities can help their members in ways rarely captured by conventional economics, from shepherding natural resources to finding employment and providing childcare. But communities can be oppressive and destructive of individuality. Liberals do not see communities as an unalloyed good, but seek to maximize their benefits and minimize their harm for individuals by promoting and developing liberal communities. And families, families too, as communities, they can be oppressive. Some of us from the LGBT plus communities have had to fight for people to accept our view of family. Liberal communities require inclusive democratic structures in order to decide what they do. They need to recognize the equal standing of all their members, including upholding individual rights, respecting privacy, promoting diversity and safeguarding minorities and individual dissent. Collective decision-making should be based on the sharing of in information and be open and transparent. That requires in larger, more complex and more powerful communities, formal procedures that are accessible, fair and open to challenge. Such democratic structures and processes are more difficult to sustain online 
and more open to manipulation and control and technical payments. How communities relate to one another is important. Liberals value diversity and self-determination. That involves some basic principles that groups and communities do not encroach upon one another's legitimate spheres of influence and activities, but they can legitimately take an interest across organizational boundaries to uphold fundamental rights. In a formal sense, that is federalism. A key liberal concept, perhaps more relevant today than it has, ever has been. And as an exile Lancastrian, I know what it's like to have this feeling that we are neglected and ruled from afar by people who don't know us and understand the sort of society we wish to create. Differences and conflicts should be re resolved as far as possible by discussion, debate, negotiation, compromise, and mediation. Litigation and legal enforcement are a last resort, and arbitrary authoritarian imposition never acceptable. Violence and warfare represent pain. Individuals and communities can thrive and flourish and, in, and indeed survive only within an environment that is sustainable. All species, including humans, and all natural systems are interdependent, supporting one another in an ecological balance in which diversity promotes survival and uniformity tends towards extinction. The planet is now suffering serious environmental degradation as a result of human activity. Unless halted and reversed, we face a crisis that in the ultimate could be terminal for the survival of civilization. That environmental crisis is being driven by a model of conventional economics that is dangerously faulty. It postulates that social progress is dependent on an annual percentage growth in economic activity, GDP and GWP, gross world product. That cannot be sustained. It is exponential growth. A fundamental law of mathematics is that exponential growth always comes to an end. In practice, it usually ends catastrophically. So 3% over a year, might sound modest, but it becomes more than 50% over 15 years, over a thousand, uh, over a hundred percent over 20 years, and around a thousand percent over a century. That model of, of the economy is at an accelerating rate, stripping the planet of its natural resources and polluting it with discarded waste. We are already running short of. Uh, of the rare earth minerals needed to support advanced technology. Plastics and CO2 are the clearest example of dangerous pollution of the natural environment, but not the only ones. That model also has another major fault. It is creating growing inequality. Wealth creates wealth. It concentrates wealth. It is creating a small elite of super rich corporations and individuals at the expense of growing levels of poverty, both in Britain and around the world. That pattern needs to be broken. The theory and practice of community politics lacked an economic dimension. We need a new model of economics, a theory and practice of community economics. The central precepts of community economics are simple. There are nine of them. First, the primary role of communities is to determine their political, social, cultural, and environmental objectives. Economics is the mechanism for achieving them, not the other way around. Two, liberal communities need inclusive democratic structures to debate and decide their objectives. Three, Exponential growth in the consumption of natural resources 
and the discarding of waste cannot be sustained and must end. Four, incremental growth based on conserving natural resources, minimizing and recycling waste is possible and necessary. Five, prosperity and economic development depend on the creation of wealth. Six, the equitable distribution of wealth is as important as its extent. Seven, wealth embrace, embraces all that communities value and aspire to in creating a civilized and rewarding lifestyle and environment. It consists of more money, goods, and services, and more than the accumulation of personal possessions. Eight, wealth is enhanced by trade and exchange. Nine, Aspiration, ambition, and goals are the most powerful motivation for learning and education. Qualifications and training are means to those ends, and not ends in themselves. Well, that's the theory. It is applicable and relevant to any kind of community anywhere. There is no rigid blueprint for the practice to be applied inflexibly everywhere. But there are some general approaches that are of particular importance for poor and deprived communities in Britain and around the world. As with community politics, the practice of community economics is a process of social transformation. It requires a presumption of democracy in all communities and organizations. Britain is one of the most centralized states in the democratic world. Its local government structures have atrophied, have atrophied and require reconstruction. It has no structure of neighborhood democracy. Parish councils have limited powers and in most urban areas do not exist at all. The nations of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland need as a matter of urgency now to, to progress to complete domestic home rule within a federal constitution. A federal constitution that also creates extensive independent powers to the, in, to the regions of, English, uh, of, of England, and particularly Lancashire in the Northwest. The same applies internationally. All supranational bodies such as the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, the EU, and the Commonwealth, need Britain's involvement and a clear commitment to democratic processes. Our exit from the EU was a serious backward step. But democracy does not step there, stop there. It must, for example, extend into the workplace, into the NHS, over-centralized and largely outside democratic control as it is, and into the police and criminal justice system, whose independence and democratic accountability have been so severely undermined. For that presumption of democracy to become a reality, it must be central to education. Schools and colleges should be workshops of democracy, where its processes are learned and its practices introduced and applied. The essence of incremental growth is production for long life, preserving what exists, building on it gradually, rather than discarding, throwing away and starting again. Redundant materials, which should be minimized, should be recycled and reused. What goes for materials also applies to energy. Heat should be considered through high levels of insulation and the use of natural venting for cooling. That applies as much to IT service and industrial plants as it does to buildings. The use of fossil fuels must end in favor of solar, wind, and tidal energy generation. CO2 capture and storage, although it may be necessary, must not be used as an excuse for not doing it. 
the equitable distribution of wealth not only requires the regulation and control of large national and international corporations through the prevention and ending of monopolies and through taxation, but equally by investing and strengthening the economies of poor and deprived communities. In Britain, the introduction of land, tax, land value taxation at uniform rates across the country would do more than any other single measure to redress geographical inequalities. But it's a local tax at varying rates, it would do exactly the opposite. Large corporations and public authorities tend to, to undermine local economies. They centralize production, supply, and the provision of services. They displace local employment. They export profits and usually export salaries too. They, do, they put decisions in the hand, hands of local outside so-called experts with no understanding of or feeling for local circumstances or the communities they're there to serve. They undermine diversity and local choice. Strengthening poor and deprived communities, both in Britain and around the world, stems from local ownership and control from local inclusive democratic decision-making. It requires investing in local skills, promoting local enterprises, local employment, local production, purchasing and procurement. From encouraging local farming, local produce and markets, and for, and for facilitating it all with local banking and financial institutions that promote local investment and lending and um, lending driven by computer systems fails to address real need it's absolutely appalling anyway these local measures they keep money circulating within local communities and not leaking out they motivate individuals and communities to develop and release their potential to pursue their aspirations and attain their goals. Many of the most valuable aspects of communities cannot easily be quantified or given a monetary value, yet they require be belief and motivation to invest in the physical and intellectual resources to produce them. They include knowledge, skills, and experience, moral values, often but not always incorporated into faith and religious tradition. Political values, such as democracy, free speech, justice, and the rule of law. Scientific research, philosophical exploration, culture, the arts, music, and creativity. Networks of common interests and friendships. Some are rather more tangible, but equally hard to quantify. The quality of our built environment, of architecture, of villages, towns, and cities, the quality of the natural involvement and the welfare of living beings. These aspects of life, central as they are to civilization and the core of human happiness, all contribute to the wealth of a community, of whatever size or nature. They cross boundaries between communities. We tend to think of trade and exchange solely in terms of goods and services. Of greater importance, when communities engage with one another to exchange knowledge, experience, ideas, and culture, it generates a rich melting pot of creativity. It opens up opportunities for the fusion, fusion of an emergence of new ideas. It expands diversity and choice. Communities that self-isolate narrow choice. They stultify and cease to flourish. And that's what's happening to Britain today. Community economics is a natural extension of community politics. It is part of an agenda of political transformation to create a liberal society. That is a process of continuous change. People in different times and places have different aspirations. 
diversity of choice are the hallmarks of a liberal society. The realization of community economics requires changes in the international regulation of multinational corporations and world trade to safeguard their competition. It requires legislation in the UK to prevent national, regional and local monopolies. It requires action by local authorities and statutory agencies to release assets to local ownership and control. All these actions and more across a host of different structures of power are needed to release the potential of community economics. But community economics does not depend on that alone. There is a key role for community activists and individuals, wherever they are, to take action directly within their own communities. As I witnessed yesterday in Morton, to release their potential for self-determination by applying in practice its values and processes. Community economics will become a reality to this, the extent to which it becomes a broad-based movement, both within and without the structures of power. It does not stand alone. It is an intrinsic and necessary extension of community politics. Let's remember community politics' key message. People should take and use power for themselves, both within and outside the formal structures and process of government. The role of us as Liberal Democrats is to promote and encourage that process, not to try and do everything ourselves for other people. Our role is to be the vanguard of the movement throughout society to enable people to take control of their own lives and the future of their own communities. That is the essence of liberalism. Thank you very much.